Why is the average person holding on to 25 to 30 more pounds of weight compared to 50 plus years ago? This is a question brought up in a scientific review published by Dr. David Ludwig. In this review, he explains a more controversial explanation for this sudden rise in weight gain, something counterintuitive to the conventional model of calories. But Dr. Ludwig has some staunch opposition because another set of researchers headed by Dr. Kevin Hall vehemently disagree. So who's right, Ludwig or Hall? Well, I read six reviews and rebuttals going back and forth between these two research groups to make sense of both sides. And I'd like to break it down for you now. You see, Dr. Ludwig espouses the carbohydrate insulin model as an explanation for our rising weight gain. And Dr. Hall still holds true to a more traditional model called the conventional model, wherein calories are still the primary focus. I'll go ahead and tell you that I've always followed the conventional model up until now, but after reading the science behind both sides, I can admit to you that some things have changed for me, but will they for you? Let's see. To start, we need to understand each model. So allow me to introduce you to Dr. Ludwig, who will introduce the model, and then I'll fit in some more of the physiological details later. I'm Dr. David Ludwig, author of Always Hungry. Always Hungry has a simple premise. Overeating doesn't make you fat. The process of becoming fat makes you overeat. The low-fat diet we've been told to eat for 40 years has triggered our fat cells to hoard too many calories, leaving too few for the rest of the body. So we get hungry, our metabolism slows down, and we gain weight. Cutting back on calories only makes this situation worse, creating a battle between mind and metabolism we're destined to lose. It's like treating fever with an ice bath. Sure, you can force temperature down for a while, but the body fights back with severe shivering and blood vessel constriction, and you'd feel miserable. Treat the cause of fever, however, and temperature decreases naturally. The cause of weight gain is too much of the hormone insulin, which drives fat cells into a feeding frenzy. Treat it, and fat cells calm down, releasing their stored calories back into the body. When that happens, cravings vanish, metabolism speeds up, and you lose weight without struggle. All right, now to discuss the science, I'll lean on some reviews that Dr. Ludwig has written. Therein, Dr. Ludwig accuses the conventional model of being unsatisfactory for explaining the obesity epidemic. In the proposed carbohydrate insulin model, eating a lower carbohydrate, higher fat diet leads to significant changes in metabolism and hormonal profile. If we can lower the hormone insulin in the bloodstream, we can reduce hunger, increase body fat loss, and boost metabolism. How though? Well, insulin is well known for allowing blood glucose, sugar, from the bloodstream into the cells. I've explained this many times here on Physionic, but additionally, it promotes fat molecule uptake and reduces the activity of fat breakdown enzymes like hormone-sensitive lipase, which would normally liberate fat molecules from the fat cells to be released into the bloodstream. Since carbohydrates stimulate insulin the greatest, it stands to reason that reducing carbohydrates is the appropriate course of action for reducing this hormone's prevalence and reducing fat uptake into the fat cells. Beyond this mechanism, it is also believed that insulin and potentially other hormones shift the partitioning of calories into fat cells specifically. As calorically dense nutrients are absorbed into fat cells, there is less nutrient availability for other cells that require energy, leading to a need to consume more to fulfill their needs. As such, we gain body fat, yet want to eat more because our other cells, other than our fat cells, which are growing from the nutrient burden, are starving. So overeating is a consequence of increased fatness, not the cause. So now we understand the carbohydrate insulin model, and we'll return to it in a minute to describe some of the scientific evidence put forth by Dr. Ludwig and colleagues. But I'd like to give the floor to the competition so that they can have a say on what they feel is correct. 
Dr. Kevin Hall, as I mentioned earlier, is a researcher that defends the longstanding dogma known as the conventional model. Yeah, so it's certainly not just my research, right? I mean, I think that this is the, the, the point of, you know, this new paper that we wrote was we are trying to kind of correct some of the misconceptions that people have had, both the lay folks as well as even in the research community about, you know, what is kind of the consensus sort of standard model that we have right now about, you know, what drives, what has driven both, you know, the increase in prevalence of obesity among different societies, as well as, you know, what explains why some people were more susceptible to whatever changes happened in our environment uh, to cause obesity. And so, you know, what we were trying to do in this most recent paper in AJCN was, you know, try to put to bed a lot of the myths that are out there about, not about an absence of willpower. It's not about an, an inability to count calories. Um, it's, you know, what we believe is it's probably not about, you know, some sort of hungry fat cells that are, you know, sucking in too many calories. It's probably not about carbs overall or fat overall. Um, it's probably something much more complicated. And what do we understand about the biology of weight regulation and food intake control? Because we, you know, there is some debate even within, you know, the obesity community about, you know, the relative impact of physical activity, for example, versus food intake uh, or the, the built environment um, versus the food environment. Most of the folks that signed on to our, our paper point the finger more towards the food environment, although we certainly don't discount the potential role for the built environment. But when we focus on the food environment, then the question is what aspects of the food environment have changed because they have to have changed in order to explain the increasing prevalence. And how does that biologically get translated into a change in basically energy balance? I mean, all the models that we have have to, you know, at the end of the day, result in an increase in calories over calories consumed over calories expended. The question is, what's the direction of causality? What are the key culprits in determining that? And our understanding currently is that, you know, the brain is playing a key role in this. It's, it's sensing the internal signals uh, from our hormones, from our nervous system, uh, from signals in our GI tract. Uh, from uh, from peripheral tissues and sensing their energy status. Okay, that was a lot. So allow me to distill it, or is it concentrate it? Sidebar, it's always seemed to me that it makes more sense to say concentrate because I'd be putting more information in a smaller time slot as opposed to diluting it, which would mean I'm putting the same amount or less information in a longer time slot. Anyway, let's disentrate it. <laughs> Can't fool me, English. Dr. Hall posits that calories matter tremendously, but they aren't the end-all be-all as an explanation. It isn't as simple as a lack of willpower or even reducing the issue to internal cell starvation and insulin like that proposed by the carbohydrate insulin model. But rather, it is a multifaceted issue coming from our food environment and how our brain interacts with hormones. So why do both sides feel they're so right? Well, based on a review by Dr. Ludwig, he proposes a few studies wherein researchers injected insulin into rodents, and the rodents gained more body fat. We can see that here. The rats did not differ in weight, but the amount of body fat they had on them was higher when they were injected with insulin. Beyond that, he also mentioned another study wherein mice were put on a ketogenic diet and experienced an increase in metabolism, as evidenced here. We're looking at a metabolic measure, so heat, from a measuring technique known as direct calorimetry. The more heat, the higher the overall metabolism. As you can see, the ketogenic diet has from about a seven hour window where they expend more energy than the mice placed on the other diets containing carbohydrates. Overall, this led to an 11% metabolic boost over the day, certainly worthwhile. But we can't just lean on animal studies. We can also look at human trials. Dr. Ludwig cites this long-term study across multiple diet conditions and indicates that a lower carbohydrate diet leads to greater weight loss, as seen here compared to a higher carbohydrate, low-fat diet and a Mediterranean diet. 
He mentions a few other studies as well, comparing high glycemic carbohydrate diets versus lower carbohydrate diets, along with some genetic studies. So he's certainly not making things up out of thin air. Then how can Dr. Hall feel he's right, disagreeing with all of this evidence? Well, he's released a few scientific reviews and some commentaries on Dr. Ludwig's work, discussing some of the science indicating his proof. For one, he cites two metabolic ward studies. Metabolic ward studies could be argued to be the gold standard of controlled studies because the participants of the study do not generally leave the laboratory, meaning all of their habits and food is controlled. No snacking, no inaccurate results. One of these studies had participants consume a lower carbohydrate diet or a lower fat, higher carbohydrate diet, clamping calories to be equal. And they found that fat loss occurred with both diets. But the question is, was it superior in the low carbohydrate diet? The answer is no. Both diets led to equivalent fat loss, as we see here. Additionally, there was no energy expenditure advantage of the low carbohydrate diet, like that seen in the animal studies. Additionally, Dr. Hall put together a meta-analysis of all the studies that compared low carbohydrate diets and high carbohydrate diets to determine these two main outcomes, body fat loss differences and metabolism differences. Across roughly 32 human studies, we can see, as indicated by the main effects diamond at the bottom here, in measures of metabolism, there's a slight shift in favor of low fat diets, meaning higher carbohydrate diets. Additionally, when we look at the same analysis on body fat loss, we see a similar result in favor of higher carbohydrate diets. Wow, that would seem like a nail in the coffin. But, and I don't mean the attractive but with two T's, I mean the unattractive one that indicates a problem. Dr. Ludwig responds. In his response, Dr. Ludwig brings up some good points. For example, the metabolic ward studies tend to be quite short for obvious reasons. It's difficult to pay and manage keeping people under supervision for weeks, let alone months. The two studies Dr. Hall cited lasted shy of one week for each diet for one and four weeks on the other, yet that's not the main counter-argument offered. How can a scientist disagree with over 30 studies showing opposing results to his hypothesis? It seems impossible, but this, my friend, is where statistics and nuance are necessary. Dr. Ludwig proposes as part of the carbohydrate insulin model that time in a low carbohydrate diet is critical. According to him, some studies indicate that a person has to be on a low carbohydrate diet between two and three weeks to experience the benefit of this metabolic boost. Why? Because it takes that long for ketones to build up in the bloodstream being pumped out of the liver. These ketones, according to Dr. Ludwig, increase mitochondrial number, change the hormonal profile, and may have satiety effects leading to reduced consumption in their own right. So his critique is the median study duration of the studies included by Dr. Hall is only four days. Do you get what that means? That means that most studies included in the meta-analysis hover around four days in duration, which is far too short to see an effect according to this ketone hypothesis. So Dr. Ludwig reanalyzed the exact same data, minus a couple, but including three additional studies that had released since the initial analysis. And then he stratified the data based on length of study, with one group being analyzed together if they were shorter than 17 days, and the other group being analyzed if they were longer than 17 days. And what did he find? He discovered something incredibly intriguing. If the analysis was limited to just the studies lasting less than 17 days, the metabolism results corroborated Dr. Hall's findings. So agreement, finally. However, if the studies lasted longer than 17 days, they swung in the opposite direction in favor of low carbohydrate diets. So 
This means, according to this analysis, there is a time effect as predicted by Dr. Ludwig. Now, to be clear, this does not indicate a proof of the mechanism, so ketones, but it lends itself well to the overall idea that it takes longer to see an effect. What an insight. But, oh, that's right. Dr. Hall and colleagues took issue with this analysis and wrote an open commentary to the editor of the journal to point out some flaws. I won't go into too much nitty gritty because they mention issues with some of the methods used, doubly labeled water versus respiratory chamber, which are both great tools but have their shortcomings. The bottom line is Dr. Hall mentions that Dr. Ludwig didn't use all the data available to him by focusing too much on one technique, doubly labeled water, and not enough on the respiratory chamber data. So he reanalyzed the data using Dr. Ludwig's parameters of time and found similar results. So what's the big deal here? Well, I think we finally have some consensus. There might be a time effect with people on low carbohydrate diets experiencing an increase in metabolism. However, the effect size or the magnitude of the difference is still a point of disagreement. Dr. Ludwig states there is a 135 calorie increase on average technically a 50 calorie boost in metabolism per 10% drop in carbohydrates. Dr. Hall's re-reanalysis of Ludwig's reanalysis of his initial analysis, <laughs> does your head hurt too, uh, indicates a more modest 70 or so average calorie boost, and that's making certain mathematical assumptions, so it may be lower. Overall, this all gives us insight on some advantages of lower carbohydrate diets through increases in metabolism, but it doesn't actually substantiate the mechanisms underlying the carbohydrate insulin model. And there's a mountain of data that indicates fat loss is equivalent between higher carbohydrate and lower carbohydrate diets. I have videos showing this to be the case. So my take is this. I see no evidence that calories aren't the backbone of weight loss and fat loss. They are. However, there is zero doubt in my mind that focusing solely on calories will lead many people to feeling frustrated and unable to accomplish their fat loss goals. The bottom line is that in whatever way you can achieve that calorie deficit, be it with more carbohydrates or fewer carbohydrates, you should focus first and foremost on what is sustainable to you. If you binge on carbohydrates, you know your answer. If you feel sick eating too much fat, you know your answer. And if you opt for a low carbohydrate diet, you may experience a metabolic boost. But, and hear me here, that metabolic boost does not seem to be gigantic and may depend on the severity of the carbohydrate restriction. So, if you are one that feels better and finds fat loss easier on a higher carbohydrate diet, do not switch over for the metabolic benefits alone because they are likely small. I'd like to address the various aspects of each model showing proof for or against the carbohydrate insulin model and the conventional model, but that will be for future content. For now, I'm wildly curious to hear where you stand. Are you team Ludwig or team Hall? And who should Bella Swan date? Let me know. <laughs> if you're interested in a deeper dive on the matter, I expect to release a much lengthier, more detailed video on the topic. So check that out here. And if not, you can check out some of my other content here. Science, baby.